Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Leo Bartarella with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. In about a week following the webinar, we will be sending all registrants a copy of the presentation to the email that you use to register. Oh, excuse me. I will now hand it over to Patrick Yoder, who will get started with our presentation. Hello, everyone. This is Patrick Yoder. Uh, I'll be the moderate, moderator of today's uh, webinar. And we have a really exciting topic for all of you. What's trending in hospital pharmacy in 2019? Uh, this is an important topic, especially as pharmacy and pharmacists become uh, more strategic for the overall healthcare organization. Uh, and we have several uh, panelists with us, expert panelists with us today, uh, and we'll introduce them in just a second. Just a little bit of background um, for me so you guys know who I am. I actually am the CEO and co-founder of Logic Stream Health, a software company supporting many, many hundreds of hospitals across the country with a clinical process improvement and control platform. Uh, and we've had, we have many, many users who are hospital pharmacists and are using our software today. And for this reason, and with their help, we've actually built a specific application for them that's really focused on helping them solve drug shortages. Uh, and it's called the Drug Shortage App, uh, which we may uh, talk a little bit about today as well. Uh, in addition, a little, just a little more background, I'm actually a pharmacist and a PharmD. I did my training at the University of Iowa. Uh, so it's really great to be a part of this panel today uh, to discuss a variety of topics, uh, including key priorities, challenges, innovations, and future work uh, and workforce in uh, hospital pharmacy. Uh, the first thing I want to do is introduce our panel for all of you. Uh, I'm joined today by Karina Dolan from Vizient. Marvin Stennyfrock from Comprehensive Pharmacy Services, Seth Hartman from University of Chicago Medicine, and Tara Pierce from Elsevier. I'm gonna ask each one of them uh, to start off with just a little bit uh, more information about them and uh, what they do and their role and responsibility. Uh, let's start with Karina from Zian. Hi, thanks Patrick. Um, so hi, my name is Karina Dolan, and I'm the Director for Clinical Oncology and Pharmaceutical Outcomes for Vizient. And I'm a board-certified oncology pharmacist. I received my PharmD from Roseman University School of Pharmacy and completed my oncology specialty residency at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, prior to joining the Vizient team, I practiced in the acute care hematology oncology hospital setting, as well as in the outpatient chemotherapy infusion centers, mainly at UAB as a oncology pharmacist and transitioning to a clinical coordinator and also a co-residency director for the hematology oncology specialty residency there. My current responsibilities include leading a team of people that provide clinical and operational support for our members. And so specifically, I produce resources around oncology and high cost drugs. I assist with uh, budgeting, uh, drug budget forecasting. I educate on oncology pipeline and many other oncology and supportive care topics that are relevant to the treatment of oncology for our Vizient members. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with Vizient, Vizient is the largest member-driven healthcare performance improvement company in the country. We provide innovative data-driven solutions, expertise, and collaborative opportunities that lead to improved patient outcomes and lower costs. Our membership base includes 95% of the nation's academic medical centers, as well as community hospitals, pediatric facilities, um, integrated health delivery networks, and non-acute healthcare providers. And these facilities represent approximately $100 billion in annual purchasing volume. Thank you, Karina. Uh, Marvin, why don't you tell us a little bit about your role and responsibility at Comprehensive Pharmacy Services? Sure, thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Marvin Finneyfrock. I'm uh, president of Clinical and Purchasing Services for CPS. My background includes uh, graduate, graduating from USC School of Pharmacy. I'm residency trained, uh, clinical and management. My uh, current duties include overseeing the clinical programs and purchasing programs within CPS. That includes a team that does clinical development, uh, best practices, 
we have a learning uh, network of education processes and programs. We also look at efficiencies and uh, in operation needs, as well as the part that I oversee, which is the, the clinical programs and best practices. A little bit about uh, comprehensive pharmacy services. We provide services to hospital and, and healthcare facilities across the nation, including Puerto Rico. Everything from the standard uh, hospital and hospital systems, all the way to uh, LTACs and skilled nursing facilities and infusion and surgery centers. Uh, we have um, over 2,500 employees uh, that lead that service, and it's uh, I've been with the company for about 18 years now. Welcome and thank you, Marvin. Seth, uh, thank you for joining us as well. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your role at U University of Chicago Medicine and also a little bit about your organization. Yeah, sure thing. So <clears throat> my name is uh, Seth Hartman. I uh, got my PharmD in uh, 2008 from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and my MBA in 2017 from Oregon Health and Science University. I've, I've been working in pharmacy informatics for uh, almost 10 years now, uh, just a few months shy. Uh, through that time, a lot of time spent on the front lines and the last uh, about five years spent in leading teams uh, within the pharmacy and external to the pharmacy on different projects and different projects to be able to tackle different areas of pharmacy. My, my current responsibility is here at the University of Chicago, so I oversee all the pharmacy information systems, both inpatient and outpatient. So that includes our outpatient retail, our transitions of care, our inpatient hospitals, um, and, and all those ancillary areas. And the University of Chicago Medicine, it's a 811-bed uh, academic medical center, level one trauma center, located in the Hyde Park area of Chicago. Um, we have one of the busiest EDs in the area since we bumped into level one as of last year. And uh, if you're familiar with where the Obamas may have lived, we're just down the street from that. So that's, that's kind of a little bit of a background, a little bit of a setting of from where we're at and what I do. Great, thank you, Seth. Uh, Tara, glad to have you with us. You're with Elsevier. Maybe take a few minutes to talk about your role and responsibilities there and the background of the company as well. Sure, Patrick. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tara Pierce, and I serve as the Vice President of Strategic Alliances in Commercial Drug Information here at Elsevier. Um, in my Strategic Alliances role, I'm responsible for all of our relationships with um, software and EHR vendors um, working to incorporate Elsevier's content and knowledge into the clinical workflow. Um, I also have responsibilities for our go-to-market strategy and market approach for our commercial drug information business here. Um, I've been in healthcare for 22 years. I'm a registered pharmacist, a graduate of the School of Pharmacy at Purdue University. Um, and I have practiced in both retail and hospital settings, but spent the majority of my career working with the Drug in Information Compendia um, in, in this industry. A little bit about Elsevier. Um, Elsevier, if you're not familiar, is a global information analytics business specializing in science, technology, and health. And we help customers make better decisions deliver better care and combine content with technology supported by operational efficiency to turn that information into actionable knowledge. We're a global organization with a presence in 48 countries and have around 7,500 employees. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Tara. Uh, it's great to have all of you and uh, it's exciting to be uh, part of a, such an expert panel. Uh, so let's move on to, the, to our topic today, what's trending in hospital pharmacy. Uh, the format of today's webinar will be a Q&A session, and I'll uh, moderate that by asking panelists uh, certain questions, and we'll move uh, around in sort of a virtual table format. Uh, and we'll begin with Karina and then move, move on down the list, and we may, you know, uh, ask some sidebar questions as well just to, to really address hot, hot topic areas. Uh, our first segment uh, addresses challenges and priorities in the hospital pharmacy today. So Karina, let's begin with you. What are the key activities hospitals and health system pharmacies need to accomplish to be successful in 2019? 
Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, I think this is a, a great question. Um, I think the biggest action hospitals and health system pharmacies are working through um, in 2019 in order to meet the regulation that is taking effect this year is the USP Chapter 800. Um, uh, this practice standard are for handling hazardous drugs and hazardous materials. Um, it's really, this chapter is about protecting healthcare workers and promoting the safety of patients and healthcare personnel. Um, there are other chapters being updated. However, Chapter 800 is the most significant because it will be implemented for the first time this year, and it will require many changes across the entire institution. It begins with the receipt of a hazardous drug and it ends with the disposal of that drug. And it's not limited to only pharmacy, which makes it so cumbersome. It also includes nursing, materials management, environmental service staff, transporters, and it requires a clear containment strategy for the handling of these drugs. And so I think for 2019, that's one of um, health system's main um, activities going on. Great, we might come back to that in just a little bit. So Marvin, what are your thoughts about key activities uh, that hospital and health systems pharmacies, or pharmacies need uh, to accomplish to be successful in 2019? Uh, I agree uh, with Karina said on regulation. I think, you know, pharmacies more and more uh, burden with regulation. You cannot be a director of a pharmacy now without being an expert in regulation and the things that not just the states are requiring but also federal government and other agencies so uh, one of the big things that i like to think about and the challenge is really for those directors to be efficient you have to you can't be everything you can't be everywhere so really having having time to be efficient uh delegating and you know trying to tackle those uh regulatory uh issues you know, one of the uh, one of the pieces that ties into that, and we'll probably talk about more about it, is around data management. And and you know, you can't look at the regulatory stuff. You can't be efficient if you don't have good data uh, to rely on. So that's how I look at just a. And that's just is a loaded question for sure, right? I mean, uh, there's a lot that could be covered, but that's how I look at uh, some of those challenges. Great, thanks, Marvin. So it sounds like regulations are a big deal. Um, certainly for the directors of pharmacies, uh, and also from uh, from some 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 ways uh, data management as well. Seth, what are your thoughts about the areas where activities where hospital and health system pharmacies need to be accomplished or need to what they need to accomplish to be successful in 2019? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. I <clears throat> um, I won't harp on USP 800, although that is a big issue for any hospital pharmacy for 2019. Um, I, I think some other areas that we're trying to pay key attention to is really trying to expand our transitions and outpatient services for hospital pharmacies um, in an effort to support growth of inpatient services. You know, through, through this era of declining reimbursements, and, you know, we all saw yesterday or Monday the Department of Justice ruling on the ACA and some of the other activities that are happening, you know, it, it's a relatively dynamic environment when it comes to reimbursement for health systems care and to be able to afford the types of uh, services that we want to render to our patients. So growing these ambulatory services, setting up good networks for providing that, uh, being able to compete with the bigger companies, the Amazons and the others that are in the world that are, you know, buying up companies like PillPack and doing compliance packaging. There's a lot of things we want to be able to do to be able to maximize that part of our business so that we can grow the inpatient side of the business as well. Part of that is uh, paying attention to 340B programs. You know, we are a dish hospital. Um, so again, make sure we can grow that program and make sure that we can show community benefit from that program. Being able to reinvest those dollars into the south side of Chicago is really important to us. Um, we're of course paying attention to shortages, which I think we'll talk about here in a little bit. And then for us trying to grow our antimicrobial and pain stewardship practices. Uh, both of those are becoming more and more um, important. Antimicrobial stewardship has of course been under the guise of the CDC for quite a while, but now pain stewardship is getting looked at by CMS and being recommended. So we're trying to develop our pathways around those as well. Great. Thanks, Seth. So, so just to kind of key in on one thing that you mentioned there. So you mentioned expanding ambulatory services uh, so that you can therefore expand inpatient services. Could you just spend a little bit more time uh, yeah. explaining that a little bit? There's a couple of different models for how you can how you can look at this. One of them is simply growing your business to be able to afford other business, right? So if we 
start new business lines or revenue lines in the outpatient sector, we can bring in dollars we otherwise wouldn't have because that's not a capitated market. So that market is a fee-for-service. So you can derive revenue on a uh, sort of fee-for-service basis, like I said. Uh, the capitated market on the inpatient side is relatively limited. And uh, if you're a disproportionate share hospital or if you're a hospital that has a pretty large majority of Medicare and Medicaid patients, your reimbursement per patient is incredibly high. So if you want to be able to provide new services or new lines, you can grow parts of the business you haven't otherwise seen and focus on those areas so that you can offset the cost of expansion for new pharmacists or new, new uh, service lines on the inpatient side. And then you can use those in transition settings. So having a pharmacist who might specialize in endocrinology on the inpatient side, work with those teams, around with those teams, can then maybe have a few days to work in the clinic and see patients there to help balance their medical care. Um, it's ways of, of offsetting the time and ways of offsetting the cost of those pharmacists by helping derive some revenue from them as well and providing outpatient services in new areas that we wouldn't otherwise have. Great, that sounds interesting. So Marvin, I know you work across many, many, many hospitals. Um, is this something that you're seeing as well uh, at your multiple different sites? Absolutely. We have several sites that have that have ambulatory care uh, pharmacists inserted within medical groups, uh, MTM, and some of the front line through some of the retail space. You know, the the biggest challenge around that is getting paid. And, you know, hopefully with provider status and some other things that will hopefully be coming down the line for pharmacists, I think that will help. Uh, but right now it's following the money and, and who's going to get paid. That's some of the biggest challenges that, that we see. And then, of course, it's the age old um, item that pharmacists and pharmacies always have to do is you have to have to show the benefit. You know, you have to prove yourself. So those are the biggest challenges I see with that. Great. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. I think everybody has to kind of show their their value these days in in the healthcare world for sure. So Tara, let's finish up with you. What key activities uh, do hospital hospital and health system pharmacies need to accomplish to be successful in 2019? Sure, Patrick. These are great points being raised by the panelists. I would also just touch on specialty pharmaceuticals. Um, over the last several years, specialty pharmaceuticals have seen spending growth of 17 to 22 percent. And in 2019, are expected to comprise 50% of U.S. drug expenditures. Pharmacy executives must manage medication expenditure while adhering to their formulary, minimizing drug shortages, and focusing on team-based care. Since specialty drugs represent one of the fastest growing segments in the pharmacy market, many of the larger health systems are developing strategies to take advantage of this revenue stream. In order to provide comprehensive services associated with specialty drugs, Health systems are investing in infrastructure, systems, processes, staff, and procedures to match the capabilities of specialty limited distribution channels. These networks are also obtaining certification by agencies such as URAC to confirm their specialty operations meet the same rigorous standards offered by alternative distribution channels. So under a fee-for-service reimbursement system, IDN-based specialty pharmacy operations can generate incremental revenue and margin at a time when profit associated with most of these service lines is actually shrinking. That's interesting. So, does, Seth, does this include some of the work that you guys are doing on the ambulatory side as well, specialty pharmacy? Yeah, we have a, a fairly robust specialty pharmacy team as well as services and uh, um, Paying key attention to that area, making sure you have access to narrow networks and being able to provide for patients that you wouldn't otherwise be able to keep in network um, is a high priority for us. You know, we we service a lot of patients and there's a lot of different covers in the south side of Chicago. It's a really big city. And so we want to make sure that we can provide the best for those patients. We believe that we, the University of Chicago, can do that better than anyone else. So we're trying to make sure that we have the right services from a pharmaceutical standpoint to be able to do that. Great. Well, of course you can, Seth. Like, we wouldn't expect you to know. <laughs> I'm just lucky there's no other uh, Chicago hospitals here. We're all really competitive with each other, so I can say that and not get <laughs> like bastard here. <laughs> Great. Uh, so moving on to the, the second question, uh, and we'll start with you again, Karina. What are the 
specific top challenges facing pharmacy leadership in 2019? Sure. So I think um, really, unfortunately, there are, you know, as many of us are familiar with, there are many problematic issues that are impacting pharmacy today. Pharmacists are responsible for ensuring accurate and appropriate medication management across an increasingly complicated and expansive landscape, really to Seth's point about his, um, you know, expansion and growth and networks. Um, I see some of the top demands placed on leadership um, are really managing the continued dramatic growth of drug costs, um, particularly related to novel and specialized drugs, to Tara's point earlier. Um, we're also seeing an increasing number of patients with multiple and chronic diseases that have complex medication regimens um, and required, um, uh, required to care for that patient. Um, and I think um, also, there is a lack of a methodology that aligns the cost of pharmaceuticals with the outcomes they provide, and that's an arena that um, we are trying to move towards as healthcare overall. And of course, um, drug shortage, drug shortage crisis, um, which results in an ongoing absence of the stable supply of essential and frequently critical life-saving drugs. And I know we're going to talk about that more um, in, in the upcoming questions, but I would say those are um, some of the top demands placed on leadership. Great. Uh, Marvin, what are your thoughts about the same question? Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I don't want to restate some of the things that already have, have been stated, but, you know, drug, of course, drug shortages, hyperinflation, regulatory, um, uh, new personnel, you know, these are all things that really hit the, those leaders of pharmacy hard. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times I like to go back to some of the more simple things, and I think we could probably do a better job. Uh, some of the, the grassroots organic type growth is, is time management, delegation of duty, you know, having good hiring practices. You know, these are all, they seem like simple things, but at, at the end of the day, when you kind of look back, you see if, if some of these processes were better, then it helps us uh, do better with some of those bigger items that are really hitting. So that's uh, that's my uh, opinion. So some of the fundos, fundamentals can really help with uh, some of the other more complex problems as well. Yeah, you'd be really surprised what some of those things are kind of forgotten and not really practiced. Yeah, for sure. So, I'm, I, you know, one of these things that's kind of interesting that Karina mentioned, I think you may, may have mentioned as well, Marvin, is the managing prescription costs. And, um, I mean, you don't have to comment on this specifically, but at some point it would be good to hear from, from folks what they're seeing uh, uh, and how organizations are really trying to do that. Um, so, Seth, moving on to you, uh, what are some top specific challenges facing leadership in pharmacy today? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, try to come up with a slightly different angle on this and say that, you know, we're, we're in this era of declining reimbursements. And of course, we have uh, drug prices that are continuing to skyrocket, patient volumes that are continuing to grow. And so we're needing to continue to produce more value for our patients with fewer FTEs um, to be able to continue to make the business run appropriately. So to me, and of course, I have a particular bend on this working in informatics, but this is uh, increasing the need for automation. So we're we're constantly looking at and constantly investing in new automation solutions and different softwares or platforms that help us a make decisions more quickly so bringing things to our clinicians and front-end users in a simpler format that requires less upfront work to do that but also then investing in solutions like robotics and different formats that allow us to produce what our patients desire without as much human intervention and to increase our safety and efficiency at the same time so we're, we're focusing on this and we're focusing on how do we train our workforce to be able to handle this? How do we train our technicians and pharmacists to understand these new automations and information systems? And how do we keep and retain that workforce that becomes highly specialized in these areas to incent them to want to stay and continue working with us instead of going somewhere else to be able to maximize their skills? So partially leadership, mentorship, and partially investing in these new technologies and bringing those in is where I see uh, our top challenges facing the leadership right now. Great. So it seems like technology, I mean, it would make sense since you're in informatics, but technology is a good good way for, that you've found to try to use fewer FTEs to deliver even more value. Uh, Tara, what are your thoughts about top challenges facing pharmacy leadership? 
Yeah, once again, I, I think the points that have been raised around controlling costs um, are, is certainly a top challenge facing pharmacy leadership today. I think a, a couple other points just to introduce into the conversation is um, this area of the role and leadership capacity for pharmacy related to behavioral health and opioid addiction issues. As we know, the impact of this epidemic on our on our community is is dramatic, um, and the the effective drain that that can put on our um, first responders and and other emergency resources in order to to, to manage um, those problems in our communities. I think another area um, that is is a challenge and an opportunity, of course, is the inclusion of the role of pharmacy in the um, in the care team, but also in the C-suite. Health systems must capitalize on the strategic business and patient care strengths of the pharmacist and do a better job, perhaps, of recruiting them into C-suite positions. Um, and recognizing the expertise that can be brought to innovative care models, medication services, and managing business profitability. So I think as this ecosystem gets even more critical and, and complex, there is an, an opportunity here um, to, to address some of those, those challenges with the, the expertise of the pharmacist in higher leadership roles. Great, great points, Tara, uh, and great, great thoughts there as well. So Karina, I wanna come back to one of the first things that you said. So you mentioned, you mentioned managing uh, prescription costs. Uh, do you have, or have you seen specific um, approaches that organizations have taken to begin to better manage prescription drug costs? Sure. So um, since my wheelhouse is in the oncology arena, I, um, I talk a lot about high-cost drugs and, of course, some of the most expensive um, drugs, it always seems like they always fall to oncology, right? Um, so some... Um, uh, avenues that members have taken and, and we've seen some literature on are having um, stewardship programs around chemotherapy um, and also creating committees um, similar to like a P&T committee around high cost drugs. Um, and so we kind of use that same model for the stewardship, much like the antimicrobial stewardship for, um, op for um, not, I'm sorry, not opioids, uh, for oncology drugs. Um, looking at where oncologies are, um, oncology drugs are given, um, wrapping in a lot of what Seth talks about, about reimbursement and is this the, the most appropriate site of care. Um, and so folding in all of, all of those metrics and then also with um, high cost drug committees, um, creating a committee, like I said, similar to a P&T committee where they're evaluating, um, you know, again, site of care for this drug. Is this a one time administration inpatient? Can it be given outpatient? Um, and really looking at the economic um, and, and the use and the location of that drug. Great insights there. So Marvin, you do this across many, many different pharmacies. You might have pharmacies. You might have a, a little different perspective, uh, but it'd be great to hear your thoughts about managing drug costs. Sure, absolutely. You know, I think, you know, around, we've already mentioned several times uh, specialty pharmacy and specialty drugs. You know, they they just go up and up in uh, price. Uh, but, you know, good news is around those drugs, you know, we, we actually do have very good outcomes for patients. I think uh, just some of the, uh, the mid-level specialty drugs and high-cost drugs, I think with, with good patient management, uh, you, you can get the outcome that you're trying to achieve. You know, looking at labs, I think, um, and, and patient utilization, compliance. I think that's where pharmacy can really make uh, a big impact in, in drug costs and those specialty drugs. But just some of the, the very simple things, you know, looking, you know, the, the age old polypharmacy that probably most everybody on, on this call uh, knows about and there's nothing new to them, but you know, going back to some of those basics, you know, looking at how many drugs a, a patient's on, what do they need to have all those meds? And, the, you know, of course, the big piece of that is education. And I think education is going to help with those positive outcomes. All great ideas and great approaches. Uh, Tara, do you have anything to add there about managing drug costs? 
I think that the points that have been raised by the other panelists are, are, are spot on. And I think, you know, continuing to look at ways to um, manage and, and leverage analytics um, in terms of um, being a bit more um, proactive versus reactive in, in some of the purchasing and in managing and understanding the trend in the market around available options are, um, are, are key and continue to evolve in a fashion to do this more effectively and without such a, a burden on the, the, the hospital you know, pharmacy system. Perfect. All right, so we're going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about, uh, and it's been mentioned, but an important topic that uh, is facing most hospital pharmacies today, and that's drug shortages. So let's spend a little time getting the panel's uh, perspective on uh, the shortage crisis and what best practices are for mitigating the crisis. Karina, let's start off with you. Sure. Um, so the uh, the drug shortage crisis, um, I, I have... Um, believe is due to um, many factors. Um, you have manufacturing problems, intermittent lack of raw materials, there's industry consolidation, there's recalls, um, also regulatory enforcement affecting multiple suppliers at the same time has also impacted uh, the drugs. Um, also product discontinuations. I think those are just a, um, a few to name that I think are um, some of the forces that are driving drug shortage and also, um, last year, we experienced shortages due to natural disasters as well. So all of those, I think, are, are really the, some of the reasons that are driving drug shortages. Perfect. Uh, Marvin, do you have any other uh, things that you see at your level that are really driving drug shortages? Sure. I, I think uh, Karina really hit, uh, hit all the big stuff, but let me throw a couple other things other ideas in there or uh, concepts. You know, one of the, the big pieces, of course, supply and demand and profit, profitability. And, you know, I understand that from the manufacturer level, some of these things become a, a financial uh, solution for them. And those are, those are things I can't do much about, but, you know, the things I can do things about is looking for alternatives, looking at, um, uh, you know, how these things are utilized, but also, you know, going to the wholesaler and making sure that there's adequate supply. And uh, one of the big things that, that does harm, I think, over the across the board, and I know it needs to happen, is this concept of allocation. So based on what you ordered uh, last year or the last few months is what you get going forward or, or some percentage of that. So, you know, one, one shortage, uh, uh, causes another shortage, so it, it's it's on and on, and it, it is very frustrating. Sure. So, Seth, I think you probably are in the front lines with uh, drug shortages to some extent, being in in a health system. Maybe you can provide the perspective uh, from a you know hospital pharmacy director. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have to agree with what. Uh, Karina and Marvin have said so far, I mean, there, there are myriad reasons why uh, drug shortages are becoming such an issue and are persisting as such an issue. But one of the reasons in which they uh, have gotten worse over time, I believe, is our reactivity to it. So we, we've learned as health systems that if you can get early notification of a shortage and buy up, then you can last a little bit longer through that shortage. What that does is it depletes the inventory much more quickly and you end up with overstock that you don't necessarily need at your health system. Um, there isn't a good way right now, short of allocation, to manage this that I'm aware of, of being able to understand what the total available inventory is in the nation, be able to share those resources across those in the nation and understand true needs for utilization so we can make actual plans. So in light of that, you know, we have committees, we have structures in place in which we take a look at what is our inventory, what is our current process for buying, how much can we sustain, what alternate agents do we have, and what sorts of uh, changes can we make to practice before we end up looking at canceling elective surgeries and cases and things like that to be able to manage them. So it, it is a complicated problem and it's a big problem and it's one that uh, I'm, I'm excited to see some of the solutions that are coming forward, um, but I haven't seen anything that's eradicating the issue today. 
Great, Seth. Thank you for that perspective. Tara, do you have any other thoughts about what is driving drug shortages? Uh, we've had, I think they've, a lot of them have probably been covered, but maybe you have some others. Yeah, I think there's been really good coverage here. Um, as Seth said, there, there's, there are so many factors that contribute. The, the one additional that I might in, introduce into the conversation are spikes in demand that result um, when the demand for a drug exceeds um, what is anticipated by manufacturers due to a change in therapeutic guidelines, a new indication, or an unexpected um, and rapid disease progression for um, or any number of those suppliers. And so as I think about this from an Elsevier perspective related to the evidence and content, you know, as, as, as therapeutic pathways and that guidance changes, um, there is always the opportunity for new research to point out an indication or a utilization of a med that wasn't anticipated, resulting in that uh, that spike in demand that their downstream causes such such a shortage. Yeah, good good point there. Um, I'm sure also that there are shortages that happen because of another shortage, uh, maybe an alternative agent, and I'm guessing Seth or Marvin or Karina or um, Tara could also comment on that as well. So uh, let's uh, cover the next question, which is really what suggestions, and there's a lot of people that are probably listening and asking, asking how do we, you know, how do we do this? How do we work towards a better situation in which drug shortages aren't so problematic for us? What suggestions do you guys have or approaches that you've seen that are working to help solve the drug shortage problem? Uh, Karina, let's start with you. Sure, so Vivian specifically, um, we provide education, we communicate to our members and support our members of when shortages occur. Um, we also actively participate in industry-wide efforts and um, to help lessen the effects of shortage. We also strongly support increased competition and the expansion of manufacturing capabilities as well as legislative actions, such as the FDA Reauthorization Act of 2017. And um, this focused on the priority review of abbreviated new drug applications for products with limited number of market participants. So those are some of the strategies that Vizient deploys. Great, so those are available for your your organization or the members of your organization? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Excellent. So Marvin, what are your thoughts? You, you, as I've said multiple times, kind of have a really broad view of drug shortages from your speech. Yeah, we, we uh, use some of those same um, uh, uh, deployment and, and informational access to to our members you know the the big piece that I just can't overemphasize here is, is communication because really that's that's the secret to this is you know getting the word out getting it to as many people as you can uh, you know we put out as soon as we know of something we put out that communication and then also try to look for alternatives uh, we also employ conservation um, kind of like the the manufacturers do an allocation to us we look at conservation you know within the various organizations you know reserve it for certain patients uh, look for alternatives you know I know Pat, Pat, you mentioned um, uh, you know one drug shortages can cause another drug shortage we are very aware of that and we try to make sure that you know picking that alternative which is probably a, a less used product we could cause a, a shortage on that one too. So we do try to employ uh, various options if those options are available. So we use alternatives whenever possible. And then the the, the big piece is not hoarding and uh, you know holding back and and over purchasing one product or thinking that you know hey this shortage happened last year, so there's a good possibility that it can happen again. So. You know, I have walked into pharmacies where they just have an overabundance of, of three or four products that were shortages two, two, three years ago. So it's really important to make sure that we are good stewards of, of these products. Really good point. So what you're saying is pharmacists are kind of pack rats. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll raise my hand for that. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. 
So Seth, what about you? You already mentioned some of the things that you guys are doing at University of Chicago Medicine. Um, do you want to add some more there? Sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> when it comes to suggestions or approaches, I mean, honestly, the the best solution we have today is uh, really vigilance. So we have a committee that meets three times a week. We meet every Monday and review anything from the manufacturer that might be looking short that week. Uh, we meet on Wednesdays to talk with all of our clinician stakeholders to come up with plans and anything that's identified between Monday and Wednesday. Then we touch base on every Friday to make sure that we have allocations for the weekend and throughout the next week for the plans to get there. Um, we have a broad stakeholdership and membership there. So all of our clinical pharmacists attend so that they understand within their service areas what their utilization is. Our medical directors are all on hold so that we can speak with them about reduced allocations. We know all of our outpatient ordering and monitoring so that we can make sure we understand how much lidocaine needs to be used in the dermatology clinic on a weekly basis so we can make sure we meet their allocations and communicate that. And then working with your purchasers so that you understand what your direct buy opportunities are, you know, if you're locked in or out of your contracting, depending on how you might want to order things, and all the different pathways that we have to be able to get and purchase medications today. These are all things that we kind of do in concert. So it, it's a heavy lift and it takes a lot of work, but it's giving us the opportunity to avoid being drastically affected by drug shortage. Just to say that we're unaffected would be a lie. We definitely are affected and we're managing this on a day-to-day -day basis, but we have the ability at least to get the right people in the room to make the right decisions quickly. And that's been a huge game changer for us in being able to manage drug shortages um, and be able to make the changes that we need to make to be able to stay in operation. So back to a comment that I think someone made earlier about data management and how important that was. So this sounds like this could be pretty intense three times a week trying to figure out all of those different uh, pieces of what you were describing there on the demand and purchasing and all the, the different parts. Is that accurate, Seth? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty intense. You know, it's several hours a week in preparation, several hours a week in uh, dissemination of those changes, you know, keeping your EHR updated and being able to track what you've changed and to be able to undo those changes when the time comes to back them out when you have the product returned. It, it's a lot of work. So, it takes uh, quite a bit of effort. Yeah, the softwares and technologies that help with that are a big boost. Perfect. So, Tara, what are, what are your any additional uh, things that you've learned from your work about approaches or suggestions to manage drug shortages? So, I think all of the points that have been raised already are 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 very valid. I think just going back to the the thinking about technology and digital tools and and allowing health systems the time to evaluate such offerings and opportunities in order to um, you know help them manage these shortages reduce the time that is needed by the pharmacist in terms of identifying alternatives that are available I think that is is key which has been talked about here um, at a high level, and I think there's also a role for all of us to play in terms of educating our legislators um, around, you know, the role that they could potentially partner in in order to to assist because the, of the the attention and focus on managing drug costs and the role that these shortages play ultimately in in driving costs for the for the system and and for our communities. So I think those are the only two things that I would add. Great, thank you, Tara. So the, uh, I'm gonna finish, I think I wanna make sure we have enough time for the audience to ask some questions if they have questions, but I think we'll do one more uh, panel discussion. And this one specifically is gonna cover innovation in pharmacy. Uh, there's obviously numerous uh, pharmacy innovations going on today in technology, you know, medications, devices, there's there's a lot of innovation going on. Let's. Let's get the views of the panel on uh, some of the innovative things that are happening. Karina, I will start with you. What innovative things are you seeing in the market that have uh, a big impact on, or could have a big impact on on pharmacy and farm pharmacy and hospital pharmacies? Sure. Um, so I have a, a couple innovations um, that come to my mind when I think about this question. And uh, Seth actually touched on a little bit. Um, one innovation currently available um, and I think will continue to improve with time are those compounding robots that Seth talked about. Um, 
like he described, these robots, they offer patient and occupational safety. Um, they actually can help with accurate recording of compounding process, and um, they enhance speed and cost efficiency for products, as well as an overall improved workflow in a pharmacy clean room. So um, I would add on to Seth's point about that, that I think that's really one innovation that we are going to, um, we have available now, but we'll continue to see its expanse and its growth um, in the upcoming years. And um, a second innovation that um, I've been following for just a little bit now and I think will really revolutionize medication management and monitoring of patients are the smart medicines that are currently in development. Um, so these are technically, um, they're actually devices, but they are smart capsules embedded with the technology that will transmit a signal once the patient has ingested their medication and um, it provides an ongoing monitoring system over patient medication adherence, which as pharmacists know, you know, the drugs only work if you take them, and it also can greatly impact, um, you know, the pharmacoeconomics um, for medications. You know, we're spending a lot of money to get these medications to the patient, and we want to make sure that they're used adequately. So uh, to me, those are two innovations that I, I think will re really revolutionize pharmacy. And you work or have worked in um, oncology, uh, Karina. So is there anything specific in oncology that you're seeing? Specific in oncology, I don't know if it would necessarily revolutionize pharmacy, but the hot topic right now is CAR-T therapy, um, which um, you know, does not directly impact a pharmacy per se, but um, that's a new uh, type of medication that we're using patients' own stem cells in order to um, really um, uh, fight off disease um, targeted. It's very targeted using their immune system. And, um, and so that to me is really the brink of just innovation in the oncology arena. Um, so that I guess that'd be my answer to that would be CAR-T cell therapy. And it's, and it's advancement in cancer that we haven't seen quite this level of advancement in, in other um, medications to date. Sounds exciting. I, I, that's kind of beyond my understanding, but um, sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin, what about you? Any thoughts about innovation or things that you're seeing uh, in the marketplace? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, thinking futuristic, uh, some and some of the latest articles that have been out is around artificial intelligence and you know i i i i do agree with some of the things that have been said about robots and robotics and i know that will always have a place and futuristic place in pharmacy it's just that you know there's there's a cost and probably will be a higher cost associated with that a lot of smaller pharmacies just can't do a lot of those types of things so they have to look for alternatives but really the artificial intelligence that i i'm focusing on or would like to focus on is on that piece about data management you know if you this is something that even a, a smaller organization can employ and deploy you know those results so getting getting good data getting consistent data uh you know that's that's a huge challenge and i think going forward if we can get um, uh, better data and using some of that data to go into algorithms that can do prediction, prediction on, you know, a chance of a drug shortage, prediction on a chance of, of which drug should be the most appropriate, uh, using it for genomics uh, decision on the best drug. Uh, just really making you know better better decisions and, and you can't do that without having data in front of you I know I had a CFO yesterday tell me that cash was king and I told him no I think data is king because I without the right data I can't get the cash so that that's where uh, I, I think the the innovations are going to be uh, I think that's very well stated, Marvin, like using the data and applying it to specific things with AI and other technologies is, is a key piece of that for sure. Seth, what are your thoughts about innovation in, in the pharmacy market? Yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll second Karina and Marvin on the robotics piece and say that uh, you know there's, there's a lot of good developments in robotics that are helping us free up FTEs to do other work um, with increasing our ability to have uh, better efficiencies and better safety. Um, and Marvin, I completely agree with you on the AI. I think, you know, whether it's machine learning, these neural networks, uh, computer vision that we're seeing that's coming out, the RPAs, the computational ethnography, the natural language processing, there's, 
there's all these different technologies that are coming out with those AI brains. And whether it's processing big sets of data to be able to determine um, if there are any correlations or causality within it, or if it's processing individual pieces of data to help us understand what's happening and to have better outcomes, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of applications of these. And I think within the next five to 10 years, we're probably going to see um, our end user clinicians, our end user pharmacists, helping train these algorithms on the fly. It's gonna be during rounds, they're gonna be asking questions and looking at things that these AI systems are gonna be suggesting for them to do uh, based on the data that they're seeing. You know, the average ICU patient generates 13,000 data points a day. It's impossible for a human to be able to capture that and to be able to understand the relationships of that data to that patient. Uh, that's what these AI systems do really well. They, they look at large sets of data and they're able to produce um, some sort of meaning out of it that we can react to as humans. So I think we'll see this paired up sooner rather than later. I'm also really interested in uh, digiceuticals. So Karina was talking about this a little bit with the smart capsules or smart medications. Um, there's also cell phone applications and things like that that are showing uh, benefits that the FDA is recommending now to help with depression screens and suicide tracking. I think we're only getting in our toes dipped into digiceuticals at this point, but I think we're going to see those combined with telepharmacy and other applications to be able to have further reach to our patients, to be able to have better tracking, offer more support than we can today, and to be able to understand when our patients are going off track. The quicker we can understand when they're going off track, the quicker we can help them get back on track or intervene, reducing the impact of some of these health outcomes that happen as a result of inadherence or maladherence or things that are going on with their pharmaceutical care. I also am particularly interested in how blockchain is going to affect our industry. Um, one for DSCSA, I think it's going to be really helpful in the tracking of medications and simplify this process of lot expiration and all the tracking that we're trying to figure out there, but also in freeing the medical records. You know, we still are challenged as health systems in understanding what happened down the street at this other entity that's not on my EHR. And I have to call, I have to get paper records, I have to talk to someone, or I'm looking at portals to try to abstract this, and that's time, and that's confusion, and that's honestly, it's cognitive power that our, you know, pharmacists, our providers are having to use to try to out. So with that, you know, the, the easier we can transmit that data, if we can give it to the patient, allow them to own those data blocks on the chain to be able to allow them to transmit them. You know, there's HIPAA and privacy rules that are being looked at as a result of this today, but these types of technologies are trying to push us forward uh, in a meaningful way. Um, and honestly, telepharmacy has been around for a long time, but we're seeing innovative solutions with it. So extending your IV reach to different communities, so that you have pharmacists centrally verifying things that are being done on robotic systems elsewhere, things like that, some innovative solutions of telepharmacy, I think are helping us been doing um, a long time inside our main hospitals, extending that to communities that otherwise wouldn't have to do it. Great, thank you, Seth. Uh, very good insights there. So Tara, we'll finish up with you. Uh, what are you seeing in innovation in, in your work in pharmacy? Yeah, I think that the greatest opportunity from innovation comes from disruption. And I think what is particularly interesting are these non-traditional entrants into healthcare and the role that they will have in terms of, of, of patient expectations and what that will mean for, for pharmacists and, and the entire uh, continuum of care. Um, one in particular that I'm certain is on the tip of everyone's tongue is Amazon entry into the pharmacy industry, um, ushering in a digital pharmacy platform will impact the status quo for pharmacies, bringing with it disruptive innovation. And while that business model is still uncertain, um, you know, Amazon has made many motions in terms of its entrance into to healthcare. And their partnership with Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, um, the acquisition of PillPack, um, Amazon has explored getting into consumer health diagnostics testing for the home, filing a patent for its Alexa voice assistant to pick up on health issues, opening the door for the for virtual care, um, their acquisition of Whole Foods, indicating you know their potential move into the retail pharmacy segment, and you know their abilities, as Seth was talking about, in terms of you know mining this data and, and mining. Um, all of this information that is out there about the patient to create this personalized experience. So I think Amazon is poised to, poised to do something, you know, big in the pharmacy space. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, the downstream impacts of that and the technology and uh, digital initiatives that, that soon will follow. 
and there certainly is a lot of exciting stuff going on as as more and more people get into the world of healthcare and the world of pharmacy, uh, which is part of healthcare for sure. Well, we're at the end of our time today, and I want to especially thank each of our panelists for joining us today. I had a great conversation and a lot of insights uh, from, from this group. So thanks to each one of you. I also want to thank Becker's Healthcare folks for producing today's session. Uh, this has been a very informative uh, session, and it's been recorded, so you can find it on uh, the website, on Becker's website, uh, shortly after the session. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to Leo at Becker's to handle any questions uh, from the audience uh, before we sign off. Leo? Thank you so much, Patrick. I think we have uh, time for one audience question, perhaps with a brief response uh, from each of you. It is, what skills or competencies should pharmacy leaders be honing to best navigate the complexities of healthcare and the unique challenges facing pharmacy? Uh, so this is Seth. I, I'll, I'll dive in if that's okay. Of course, go ahead. Yeah, so I think when we're we're talking about the skills and competencies that pharmacy leaders should be honing um, to best uh, look at these complexities of healthcare, I think understanding the pharmacy business is key. So understanding the differences in inpatient business versus outpatient business versus home infusion and other types of service lines that you're looking at. Um, Billing methodologies, the tracking, the regulations on these are all different. So hone the skills in understanding those business lines and then look at them as a business and a pro forma to understand who can do what and how can you offset costs in one to give it to the other. Um, as you start to look at that and where you have opportunity to grow based on your patients, uh, so take a look at your internal data, what's the prescription volume that's leaving your hospital, how do you understand what types of specialty prescriptions you have versus what types of standard prescriptions, which of those prescriptions, if you're a 340B entity, would qualify, which wouldn't qualify. Break your business down into those areas to really understand what your best revenue opportunity would be for growth. Maximize that opportunity and attempt to reinvest those dollars into new solutions. The solutions I would particularly be interested in are the solutions that free up FTEs and have a quick ROI. So automation solutions, technology solutions, software solutions, people solutions, whatever those might be, but look for that really quick ROI. So do your internal rate of return calculations, understand what those uh, business opportunities might be, and then try to pick those off as quickly as possible. Um, if you happen to have a pharmacist who sits in the executive areas, try to understand if you have multiple capital processes. Um, so for us here, we have two. We have the traditional capital process and we have what we call a strategic capital process. So our traditional capital ha happens on a fiscal year. Our strategic capital can happen any time that we have a really great business opportunity we need to invest in immediately. Understand both of those pathways because you might need to maximize what you're tossing into both. Some revenue opportunities can wait and the business won't disappear. Some the business will disappear if you don't immediately jump at it. So if you understand your business, you understand those revenue streams, you understand the types of individuals you need to grow a business line and how you would put together those performers quickly, you can really maximize what you're trying to do to navigate these healthcare complexities today. Thank you. Well, that is all the time we have for today. I want to thank Seth, Tara, Karina, Marvin, and Patrick for their excellent presentation and Logic Stream for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.